Nations used to be the authoritative voice on refugee policy. It would determine where refugee policy was going and why. But over recent years, particularly as the United Nations has been under pressure from member states to cut down on bureaucracy, to act more cohesively and in a more coordinated way amongst its different entities, there's been a, a sort of effort to coalesce mandates, bring mandates together, bring responsibilities together, speak with one voice through one entity. There have been efforts in the UN system and there's been hundreds of different kinds of improvement processes in the UN system that I can remember um, designed to uh, streamline the activities of when, when it comes to their political, political part, its humanitarian part, its uh, peacekeeping operations, etc. Now, this has been fine in the sense that it has improved, it's cut down on the bureaucracy, improved the coordination and coherence of the UN and UNHCR as a part of it. But in my experience, it's also somewhat complicated the work of humanitarian organizations within the UN, like UNHCR, who are obliged to work much more closely within political and military, civil military, it raises questions about the impartiality, or it, it, it doesn't raise questions about impartiality because the organization, of course, is impartial. But in the minds of those who wish to have these as questions, it, it sort of creates confusion as to whether UNHCR is really humanitarian or whether it is part of the political objectives of the UN or whether it's embedded in the um, peacekeeping and military objectives of the UN, etc. And I think that's been one issue which UNHCR has had to work with and around over, over recent times. It's also true that there are a plethora now of organisations which have protection as part of their terms of reference and the challenge has been to bring the project protection objectives of these organizations into line one with another to do away with competition and mandate competition and create coherence in in these objectives which hasn't always been easy i mean unhcr used to talk in my time, and again, I'm not speaking, of course, at all for UNHCR. I can't, and I wouldn't purport to. Uh, but UNHCR used to talk about its implementing. Implementing partners for some organisations, some of the partners became a kind of dirty word. It, it made it sound that there was a hierarchy of responsibilities with UNHCR at the top and these partners somehow below. And because they were spreading their... Um, staff and their responsibilities and their expertise was growing and accumulating, particularly in the protection area, it meant that they didn't regard themselves as implementing partners, but partners on the same level. And that has also helped, I think, to, well, it's helped to spread the capacity to do, also helped to complicate um, some of the lines of protection and confuse some of the policy directions, I can put it in. Thank you, Erica. I still have a number of questions, but I think we should first see whether we have questions from our participants uh, to this to this first block. Yes, we do. Oh, yeah. yeah, we have one question. Um, does the organization's huge involvement in material ex uh, assistance which was not originally expected, have uh, consequences on its ability to provide legal protection and to supervise the respect of international refugee law, which was originally the core of the mandate. Does the first provide leverage for the second, or is it an obstacle? That's a good question, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question, and it's a question. It's it's a question that um, is often asked with justice. Um, I think that in my experience, protection is something in some parts of the world you have to buy. Now that's 
a challenging statement, but it's a reality. I think that running assistance program, bringing assistance to places where it is needed and helping states deal with the assistance challenges of hosting large numbers of refugees in fragile areas without the resources domestically to do so, and perhaps with the danger of this creating uh, civil unrest with, with local populations, etc. I think it's very important that there is investment uh, of a financial sort and um, uh, uh, personnel sort. There is investment to um, create a welcoming protection environment and an environment that has the capacity to sustain large numbers and an environment which enables refugees, the situation to stabilize them to find a degree of self-sufficiency uh, and laying the basis for future solutions. So on the one hand, I think it is very good that UNHCR has become a major operational agency, has the capacity to bring to its work more than advocacy, more than exhortations about international instruments, but is value added at the source where that value is needed. Um, does it prevent the organization or does it somehow complicate protection um, as or the delivery of protection by UNHCR? I would say, or as long as the organization continues to prioritize protection, simply protection rather than protection through assistance or protection through the delivery of tents and food and, uh, and hospitals and, and whatever, then as long as it maintains a priority on the rights that are at issue, the responsibilities that are impacted, then I don't think the two are incompatible one with another. I think they complement. I can remember having this debate with one of the high commissioners once, a very, very good high commissioner, a Japanese woman, Mrs. Ogata, a number of years ago. And she asked me that same question. And I said, Mrs. Ogata, I see protection and assistance as concentric circles, if you like, and where the circles overlap and meet, that is where the two functions are mutually complementary, contribute to each other. But the, each circle also has an outside part to it, and there is a protection part, which has nothing to do with assistance. It's got to do with training. It's got to do with standard setting got to do with um, interacting with judiciaries and lawyers about refugee rights, etc. And that has to remain a focus of the organization. There is also a part of assistance, which actually is fundamental, doesn't really have terribly much to do with needs to be delivered, and it can be the primary need in the beginning even before anything else. So there are these two functions. They coexist, they cohabit, but they have their own space as well. This has to be recognized in the priorities of the organization, the budgetary priorities, uh, the personnel structure priorities, et cetera, of the organization. I entirely agree, but I have to say, and we have to be a little bit honest to our audience, it remains a constant challenge to get priorities right, even though the organization has been trying also to put a rights framework to assistance. But I think um, what I see is you, we always have to remind ourselves that these are the two angles and that we don't compromise too much on one for the for the sake of the other, but that we remain within this circle, this, this, this picture of the, the diff, two different circles, which mutually reinforce each other. I agree with you, Anya. I do agree with you. And I know what you mean because I've worked all my time in UNHCR and protection and I know the difficulties you can confront ensuring that um, legal protection of work of the organization 
does actually keep in focus when there are major emergencies. And things. But I want to say one other thing, and you've heard me say this before, so it won't come as a surprise to you. Protection exists or the principles exist in the service of protection. Protection, they do not drive. I mean, they have to be, they, they have to find their balance in the real world where UNHCR has to deliver on its mandate. And that real world is composed of states, it's composed of security concerns, it's composed of financial stringencies, it's composed of a whole range of things, and it's in this complex of things that you have to deliver on protection. One can't be too purist. Protection has to be, uh, there have to be absolute bottom lines, but above those bottom lines, there's a fair bit of flexibility in how you make principles work in the service of protection. Um, and I think that's the sort of discussion which the organization um, still has and probably still needs to have. It's protection in the real world. I think you're right. And uh, I think it's a very important aspect which has been outlined by the colleagues which we asked for the sound bites as whom we asked for the sound bites as, as well. And I think we would not have managed to survive 70 years without this sort of pragmat pragmatic approach. Sarah, there was one more question, right? Yes, it's more a comment, actually. Um, so, um, one of our participants said that the speed and flexibility of the UN UNHCR's emergency sector also contradicts the statement that, that UNHCR is bureaucratic. Okay, so probably a colleague coming to our support. So good. Well, that's your you you comment on that comment, Anya. <laughs> you're the one who talked about bureaucracy. <laughs> no, I think it's um you know it's important to touch base on this on this aspect because UNHCR is a bureaucratic organization, but you know this feature indeed shows that we can overcome our limits uh, as uh, international administration. I would like to move on now to our next blog. We want to talk about refugees, the refugee concept, and let's have a look what colleagues told me about whether the refugee concept is still fit for purpose. And Eric, I have a few very uh, challenging questions for you. Margit, the video. Is the refugee concept fit for purpose? Well, the definition was drafted 70 years ago and still remains as relevant today as it did all those years ago. And the drafters really crafted a concept that is still relevant today and which governments and legislative and judicial bodies around the world use to cover just about every refugee situation you can think of. Where they... Do we need a better definition of refugee? This is certainly not a new debate. In our work in Africa, we may look to the OAU's 1969 convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa, which can often be more reflective of the dominant circumstances that cause individuals to flee on the continent. As with every definition, context is critical. I would therefore encourage more introspective thinking around the label of refugee and what that means to different people, to an academic, a practitioner, a politician, a citizen. The importance and endurance of the refugee definition remains valid, but it needs to be interpreted according to the progressive evolution of international law and according to the emerging protection challenges around the world. In the case of the Americas, the refugee definition is strengthened and complemented by the application of the American Convention on Human Rights as well as the 1984 Cartagena Declaration on Refugees. There is still a significant difference for me between what is a vulnerable migrant and what is a refugee. I don't deny that migrants have rights and maybe in situations where they need some assistance on, for some of them, possibly some form of protection. But they have not lost the protection of their country of origin like, like refugees. So I think the fundamental difference remains. 
Now, in the refugee definition itself, yes, there would be there could be room for for changes. Okay, thank you. These are just a few thoughts, and we have seen already a yes, but again by colleagues drawing attention to regional instruments, but also so to some gaps. But before we go into the more challenging parts, maybe we have to get go back to the roots. I mean, what is the refugee concept? How has it been initially been conceived before we then see how it fits into today's world, Erica? What kind? What do you answer? Well, I mean, the refugee concept was originally conceived of as an individual uh, person who is fleeing his or her country because of persecution which is happening on certain very specific grounds like uh, political opinion or, or ethnicity or religious views uh, or just because you happen to be a member of a particular group in society which is uh, it, it, is not uh, uh, which is subject to a lot of discrimination. Um, you know, people will tell you that that definition um, is broad enough to encompass not only individuals but people fleeing in groups or people fleeing in large numbers. It's true it can, but it was not originally conceived for that purpose, frankly. I believe, and I, I think that's one of the issues with the definition. But um, it was also conceived of in a day before we had these large, you know, big possibilities for people to move around the world, great distances, uh, before we had issues related to refugee status becoming a very saleable commodity and people smuggling flourishing on the back of the desperation and needs of people to leave their country, moving people around, um, in a very irregular manner, uh, getting them into countries, smuggling them into countries on, on certain pretenses, etc. So it was a, it was a definition that was conceived in. It seems strange to say it now. If you you know if you if you came out of the ashes of the Second World War, you may not agree with what I'm about to say. But it was conceived in a in a in a much more um, it was in a clearer world where it was very clear who was persecuted and who wasn't and why they'd been persecuted, etc. Now we have large numbers of people on the move for a wide range of reasons, some of which relate to the earlier concept of a persecuted individual fleeing on for specific reasons, and some of it relating to a much more generalised set of problems that people are trying to resolve by leaving their countries and trying to build a life elsewhere. And I think it has, frankly, I think it has confused the, the concept of refugee. I have often talked about um, the refugee concept losing its definition. And that is partly because, and here I'm, I'm, I'm separating out, our colleagues talked about the so-called extended definition of refugee to incorporate not only victims of persecution but victims of violence. People fleeing conflict, whether it was generalised or whether it was targeting them, they were fleeing conflict and not these persecution on specific grounds as set out in the basic refugee instruments. Um, and I, I take that as part of the classical definition these days. The classical definition is individual victims of persecution, but I think it's been broadened in the um, mid 20th century to include victims of conflict and victims of violence. So I set that aside. I think what's happened more recently is that people are moving on for, for reasons of cumulative discrimination, which probably does not amount to persecution classically defined or violence of the sort that's covered by the OAU convention or the Cartagena declaration or whatever. Um, and they're also driven to move by environmental issues, by um, problems that they have compounded by environmental degradation or um, issues linked to a changing climate, um, etc. So there are a lot of reasons why people may feel an, a strong impetus 
these are not reasons that fit within the refugee definition. But because there's no easy access for these people to countries where they seek to enter to address the problems they've left behind them, their main channel is to enter through the asylum channel. So they enter through the asylum channel and they try and squeeze themselves or their lawyers try and squeeze them into the refugee effort. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In addition, it is acknowledged that uh, the refugee definition needs to modernise or interpretation, not the def self definition itself, but interpretation of the definition has to be modernised to take into account new types of persecution, new sorts of cumulative discrimination arising to the level of etc. But I think it has become a much more fluid situation. I agree with Vincent Cochetel when he says that refugees and migrants should be seen as two different subsets of people on the move, even if their needs are seen as imperative from their perspective. But um, I think it's not so easy to make these distinctions, and it has, it has helped to erode, erode the um, the boundaries of the refugee definition, and that in itself has created problems because states have become much more aggressive about people claiming asylum uh, on the basis that their motives for leaving are too diffuse and don't easily match classical definitions, etc. And it, it's led to what, of course, has been talked about some time, this asylum fatigue, of course, the fact that people coming in under the guise of asylum are coming through criminal challenges, ch channels like people smugglers, or they they may be have they may have been caught up with um, activities which are regarded as you know violent or linked to terrorism or whatever elsewhere. So you're having a lot of people, they're all moving, they're moving often together as part of one movement, but their motives are different and very mixed. And this is confusing the concept of refugee, I believe, eroding the concept of refugee. Uh, and I think that's to the detriment of refugee protection. Okay, thank you. This was more than just what, what the refugee concept originally was uh, conceived, but you have already given uh, quite some of the challenges we have today. I'm not sure whether I completely agree um, with your um, assessment of the initial refugee definition, because I wonder what, why at a time where the people who drafted the 51 convention, the refugee definition, the 51 convention, um, had all these displacement uh, in their minds from the Second World War, which was one of the greatest displacement situations we, we have had, um, why they should have not thought about the needs of people who have fled um, war and violence and not just um, in, you know, persecution in peace times. And I also wonder, Erica, I mean, whether those two are not very often interlinked. I mean, the way you have um, portrayed it, it somehow sounds as if persecution and war situations are two different things. I mean, that maybe we... No, have... no. I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to give that impression. That's what I said. I put those in the same category of more classical refugee definition. I yeah. put people who have fled conflict, um, mm -hmm. even generalised, not targeting them specifically, in the category of refugee, just as I place persecuted individuals for specific grounds, in that mm -hmm. category, noting, not least, that quite often conflict itself does specifically target for ethnic reasons, religious reasons, um, and, and so the two categories overlap. But I see them, it's probably because I, that's, these are the categories I worked with for so many years in UNHCR, I see them as refugees. The problem I have today is that these people are moving um, just as a lot of other people are moving, where their motives are less clear, they may they may be just as as uh, as as pressing 
and just as justifiable from um, an individual uh, perspective, but they are, it is helping to confuse a little concept of refugee. And I think that's one of the challenges for UNHCR in its working environment today is to be able to keep a clear focus on refugee, even, and refugee, including people who are leaving conflict environments, obviously, Anya, but at the same time, um, offer or encourage the international community to look for alternative solutions for people who are in need but whose problems shouldn't be forced into a category of persons that was never developed to accommodate them in the first place. No, thank you for this clarification. And before we go to the mixed movement, I think you remember when we were, you know, working on the um, XCOM conclusion on complementary forms of protection, we had this background you know, where we reflected, you know, who needs international protection. If you could elaborate a little bit to our audience on this, because this is behind the refugee concept. And I think it's very often not under, under well understood um, what, you know, what is meant by what is um beyond any definitions you know the thinking behind it because that will also help us to unpack the mixed movements and why UNHCR uh, is not we will then a little bit go into you know why UNHCR thinks migrants and refugees are different people but before we go into this what is the basic the core you know of why somebody's in need for international protection what we outlined in this paper we wrote together It's at its core a rights issue. It's at its core um, a security issue. It's at its core um, a needs issue. Um, I think, you know, we, we looked at this complementary forms of protection because we, we recognized at the time that the world was getting more and more restrictive. And as I said in, in early comments at the beginning of this, the, the refugee problem was starting to divide from the asylum problem for a number of states. For a number of states in the developed world, the so-called donors, although there's a lot of doubt as to, or not a lot of doubt, but a lot of debate about who's a donor and who isn't a donor, um, but for the sort of financial donor community, the refugee problem, something that exists in another part of the world to where they are, it's something that, you know, is, de to, is deserving of support and assistance and funding and whatever to assist people where they are. And the asylum problem is increasingly a problem of individuals having, been, having to be differentiated one from another on the basis of why they're moving, what, you know, what, what their needs are. And there was a lot of, there was a growing restrictiveness on the part of states to applying the refugee definition, sort of trying to control and contain the asylum problem, the movement of people from first asylum countries to third countries where they wanted to seek a more permanent and durable solution. And these third countries were happy to help them elsewhere, but not necessarily wanting to take them. And so there, there was one, one means of controlling this asylum problem was to be more and more restrictive with the refugee definition. And what when we when we just talked about complementary forms, um, we drew not least on the practices of some of the more en enlightened um, countries who are receiving asylum seekers and treating them, you know, as people with rights that needed to be recognised and addressed. Um, and they had established systems which allowed them to let, the, let these people into their countries without them necessarily having to go through the uh, very strict status determination procedures set up under the 1951 convention, which, as I said, had become, in a number of respects, quite restrictive. So complementary forms of protection were in place in, in, in a number of countries, but not in sufficient numbers 
something that UNHCR promoted very well to address these people who fell in the in the sort of grey zone between the classically and clearly defined refugee and the people who had were in a refugee-like situation but couldn't um, justify their claim against the grounds of persecution or, you know, the fact that they'd moved through different countries before arriving where they arrived, etc. So complementary forms of protection. That was one reason for it. We were, it's also because the refugee protection regime is ever more embedded in a broader regime of rights in such as the uh, basic human rights instruments, but also the rights of the child instrument, um, uh, protection of women instruments, racial discrimination instruments, etc. And of course, the regional instruments, the uh, European Human Rights Convention, and all that, that represents. And there was a lot of resort on the part of lawyers to these additional instruments complement. the protection of the open and protection space for people who couldn't argue their case through the 51 Convention, but nevertheless were able to do so on the basis of the European Human Rights Instrument or some of these broader uh, human rights instruments or some of the regional human rights instruments in other parts of the world, in Africa, for example. So this complementary forms of protection was also a, a concept and you know, more purist lawyer than I am, I know, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but well, that, that embraced also these this growing body of protections available to vulnerable and endangered people who nevertheless had difficulties um, explaining their case under the convention. Women, for example, who came from situations where, um, you know, from cultures, they, they suffered high level of discrimination um, and, and, and a high degree of, of danger for certain types of behaviors and thinking. I mean, so gender violence, for example, for those who wouldn't write it into the definition of prevention, nevertheless made available a complementary form to address them. Thank you for, for the explanation. And I think for us, I mean, just to explain also to our audience why we as Swing Nature encompassed those people that are, you know, in need of complementary forms of protection because we saw that their protection needs are similar to refugees and that the reasons why they are seeking protection are similar, namely, and I just want to refer to what Pansel said in the video. Um, they lack, they cannot return to their country of origin, they lack the protection of their own country of origin. And that's a huge difference to migrants who get into difficult circumstances on, on route. And uh, let's move to the mixed migration. Sorry, right, and just before you finish, just let me give you a very, very brief anecdote. It reminds me of it because, you know, one of the things that UNHCR used to do, I guess it still does, is a lot of training for new diplomats. When they arrive in Geneva, they are exposed to UNHCR protection, et cetera. What is it? UNHCR used to do these, these trainings to tell them who's a refugee and what the basic protections are. It was a very good program. And I was at one, at one time in an earlier incarnation in UNHCR overseeing this. And I had um, a young UNHCR colleague who had just arrived from the field and uh, was a lawyer. And I asked him, would he do the training on the refugee definition? Who is a refugee? And I sat in with him just to see how he went on with it and listening to him. And I was absolutely astonished. He didn't mention the 1951 convention definition once. What he did was, he said, I'll tell you who's a refugee. He said, when I sit down in the camps in the country I've just come from and I meet people who are very vulnerable and, you know, women who have fled and have had children on their backs and have walked hundreds of kilometres, etc. And he, he talked about the human element of a refugee. He said, if we really want to understand what a refugee is, this is, this is a refugee. These are the people you will confront and the stories you will confront and these are refugee stories. And I thought about this a lot after. Of course, I took him a bit to task for not mentioning the 1951 Convention definition, which I thought he should have. Actually, I thought that's how training more of that should come into training, give life to the words 
in the in, in, in the definition and explain what they mean to people in practice. I think, no, I think this is a very good remark. And I we liked Vincent's video a lot when we were composing it because he was very emotional also uh, in his remarks. Um, I want to come back to one aspect that you already touched upon, uh, the human rights framework. Because some, something I realized here in Switzerland, at least, is that the 1951 convention and the refugee concept are a little bit disappearing. They are less important than Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. If you read um, court decisions here in Switzerland, or if I talk to the judges of the Federal Administrative Court, if I tell them, look, I mean, this uh, is something, you know, this is an article or this is in the refugee definition of the 51 convention or in the reform uh, prohibition, they um, ob obviously kindly, uh, nicely agree. But uh, if I say, oh, there's a, there's a decision of the European Court of, on Human Rights on, on this question, everybody notes, takes, take notes. Um, so why do we still need uh, the 51 convention, the refugee concept, if we have such an elaborated human rights framework, because at the time in the 50s, there was nothing. You know, UNHCR was the first human rights instrument. Now we have a plethora of instruments internationally and regionally, and the regional instruments are sometimes much more forceful because they have courts, they have monitoring bodies, um, which oblige states and to 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 follow to fo to follow. So I mean, what what would be your advice, um, or do you think we we can mainstream the fifty one convention into human rights instruments? Well, I think the fifty one convention is mainstream as a human rights instrument. I think that debate finished a long time ago, whether it was a human rights instrument or not. It is one of a number of specific human rights instruments which deal with a specific category of persons. And there's nothing wrong with having a specific instrument which deals with a specific category of persons. That's the first thing. And I think refugees like, like children, you know, women, there are categories which instruments specifically you said, of course, these human rights instruments are increasingly supports and monitoring bodies, etc. Yes, but not everywhere. That's for certain. In the Latin American region, there's a lot of infrastructure associated with the human rights instruments, which I think are extremely important um, from a protection perspective in Europe as well. But, for example, you're not going to find them in large swathes of Asia. You're not going to find them in very large parts of the Middle East. Um, you're not going to find them um, necessarily uh, respected even in countries where uh, these human rights instruments have to be brought into the body of national law before they have any applicability. Um, those of us who've worked for so many years in the international sphere have a lot of respect for international monitoring bodies and international oversight bodies. But the minute you get more domestic and you go into the environment, domestic environments, even in Europe, but uh, certainly my country, Australia, is not immune from this, you get more domestic, you find that these human rights instruments have a very relative place. Uh, in relation to domestic law and domestic practice, so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to see them as the seen to be the panacea for all things, and particularly because, as you say, they are supported in the context by courts and or by monitoring bodies. Um, the it's a very variable situation around the world, and the 1951 Convention is a venerable instrument. It goes back to 1951, and it stood, if you like, the test of time <clears throat> and many challenges to it. Uh, over the years in UNHCR, I remember many debates with governments where they said, we're going to pull out of the Convention, it's irrelevant, it, it, it not, doesn't help us deal with the realities of the asylum problem on our territory today, and no one has pulled out. I mean, it's, it's, it's such an institution there that 
it's it has a respect which goes beyond its terms and goes beyond its critics. No, thank you. And I think this is a very important aspect. Um, you know, I think it's it's good that colleagues mentioned the regional context, the regional instruments. Um, but I would like to refer back to what you said at the at the end of the first session. Um, UNHCR is an instrument of global governance, and I think that's what we could probably also say about the 1951 Convention as an important piece of global governance of refugee issues. I have one more question under this block, which I'm sure that everybody is keen to hear your answer before we open to, to, to the audience uh, for question. Namely, um, how do you see uh, climate change as um, um, how does it impact on the refugee concept? And do we have to talk about climate refugees or would you advise us to start drafting a new convention for climate uh, related refugees? So, I mean, these are the issues, the questions that come up in, in discussions. So I know, and, and they're extremely difficult questions to answer, I think. Um, firstly, climate change is a number of things. There's obviously a changing, at least in my mind. I mean, I listen to the scientists, I believe them, and there's and I just see it. I see floods, floods in, in parts of Australia today, which haven't seen floods like this for, for, for generations. And that comes a year after bushfires went through that same region in a way that that region had not seen for generations. I mean, climate is changing. And it is driving people to adaptation strategies. And one adaptation strategy for a number of people who have little to no choice is to move away from becoming an inhabitable region. Um, in a sense, they are refugees uh, in a very broad definition of refugee, not a definition which fits in the 1951 convention, not a definition covered by regional instruments dealing with uh, people leaving violent situations, victims of violence, but they are people who are leaving because the exigencies are such that they have no choice or they may not have a choice. Um, so in that sense, I think talk about them colloquially as climate refugees is, is quite appropriate. They are fleeing something which goes directly to their physical security uh, and enables them to try and exercise the rights that they're entitled to exercise for a decent life. Um, that said, it begs the same question in sense as migrants, you know, we were you know, having earlier, I said I think that is obscuring the concept of refugee people re leaving for a range of reasons which are not really easily attributed to uh, refugee producing situations. Um, I would, you know, I would love to see a climate um, displacement convention. I doubt seriously whether there's any appetite at all for uh, states to draft instrument and abide by it. So I very much doubt that. So I don't, I don't think it's an exercise worth embarking on. But I do think it is an exercise worth embarking on to look at what the needs of these people are. And Anya, you will remember we worked quite closely together on something which generated the 10-point plan for refugees um, and in a sort of mixed, mixed asylum migration type situation. We, we looked at the kind of interventions that might be appropriate to address the needs amongst the groups who were leaving and I believe a kind of 10-point plan approach uh, to uh, climate movement or climate driven displacement is something that should be actively worked on. Different solutions for different need, recognition of need, recognition of action vulnerability the solutions which address both the needs and the vulnerabilities without distorting um, existing concepts around which a whole regime of protection, rights, responsibilities has 
Thank you. I think this is an excellent uh, suggestion. And I also um, think you, you made one point which I would like to, to repeat because it's important to the refugee content, con concept it has initially been. Namely, these are people who have left because they have no choice. It's not, I think that's an important part to understand the refugee concept. People who have no choice, that, but what you just said, and then leaving. Um, let's open and see what kind of questions we got. Sarah, what do you have on, on the list? We have two questions. The first one is on the fluidity of the notion of refugee. Is this notion of refugee breaking into different notions for different states? and even for different authorities inside these states? And does it entail additional challenges for UNHCR? I don't think the refugee definition is breaking into different component parts. I think what is different is, as we were just talking then actually, um, the needs of people relative to the reasons why they fled and the protection concerns in their case. So what is different is a different response to a different set of needs rather than a different, rather than the definition itself breaking up. You have the definition, it describes who's a refugee. It may not be so easy to understand under certain circumstances. It may require a bit of flexibility to accommodate, uh, for example, gender violence, it may uh, need to be updated in certain areas, but the, the, the core of it is, is clear. Um, but what is not so clear is how you address the needs of people who don't fall within this definition and would distort it if you tried to force them into the definition. And that essentially was what we were saying earlier about the 10-point plan. It was different responses for different needs. Um, identification of needs, identification of protection concerns, and then different responses. These channels have to be open, and they have to increasingly be open because there are increasingly people moving for a combination of reasons which um, are not easy to accommodate in refugee definition and shouldn't, but are no less important and significant and uh, threatening for these people than anything else. There's another question. Uh, do you think there would be a need? Oh, it's moving. Uh, do you think there would be a need for a special um, reviewing uh, instance like the Human Rights Committee, um, like it exists for um, the Women's Rights Convention and the Children's Rights Convention? Would it, would it make sense for the Refugee Convention to have such a review every four years, for example, if states really comply with the convention? Well. I think, unfortunately, the, as they say, you know, there's an English expression about the stable door is open and the horse is bolted. I think it's a little bit late to attach to the Refugee Convention a, um, a body that has the capacity to decide on uh, individual cases or make individual recommendations like the Human Rights Committee or the Social, Economic, Cultural Rights Committee or the Torture Committee, etc. Those conventions all post-dated the 51 Convention and they were drafted in an era when states were receptive to having, having monitoring bodies and oversight bodies with an element of um, responsibility to look at individual cases and, and uh, recalcitrant states. It's too late for that. That said, UNHCR itself is, if you like, the monitoring body for the 1951 Convention. And that's one of the things that gives UNHCR its uniqueness. It is, it's actually rooted in a legal instrument. Article 35 of that convention specifically designates UNHCR as the body with whom states should cooperate in the exercise of their responsibilities under the convention. That is very broadly drafted. It can be used, is often used, to lend authority to UNHCR's interventions with states about problems that the organisation sees in these countries. It, it legitimates, to some extent, UNHCR's active engagement on cases of refugee protection, national court systems, etc. So it is a monitoring body. That said, of course, um, there are a lot of 
whether you're an ATR can fulfill that function. I mean, it is donor dependent. It's completely dependent <clears throat> on voluntary contributions from states, which means that states have the power and the capacity to determine to some extent its policy priorities and the way it exercises its mandate. And this is seen as a liability by many out there when they talk about UNHCR being the monitoring body, the designated authority. Authority They're asking for something independent of state control, independent of an executive committee, which tells UNHCR how to use its money and how to apply it. And there's, a, there's merit in, the, in those arguments as well. But frankly, I think it's too late to set it up. There have been suggestions, and I used to be quite supportive of them. I don't know where they stand now inside UNHCR, but the idea that um, there could be a, a process of special rapporteurs, for example, of the sort used by the Human Rights Council or of the sort used by the Secretary General in New York to look at specific issues, specific problems, UNHCR took some steps uh, in the direction, um, and here I have to think about my words carefully, in the direction of uh, becoming a more aggressive um, oversight body when it came to implementation of the convention um, by uh, creating an annual consultation on protection. And the original idea of that, which I was partially behind, when I was in UNHCR was that this uh, protection discussion every year in December would address very specific issues on the agenda of the organization, would come up with recommendations addressed to states about how to do things in certain ways or how to do better or whatever. Unfortunately, though, I think that process has slowly but surely metamorphosed into a completely different process. It's no longer what you would call a sort of implementing um, oversight arrangement when it comes to protection, but it has become something I think which is very much absorbed by this global compact on refugees uh, process. And I know Anya wants to get onto that shortly. And I don't think it has the capacity, I may be wrong because I haven't been there for a long time, but I don't think it has the capacity any more up these individual issues, come up with useful conclusions, etc. And I can only regret the demise of something which existed when I first encountered UNHCR in the 1980s, and that was the Subcommittee on International Protection. That committee actually very useful conclusions on protection by consensus, which I think were or standard setting, which UNHCR, one of UNHCR's mechanisms to uh, exercise oversight over the convention. That's fallen by the board um, and the executive committee has now become such an unwieldy body of, I don't know, 106 members uh, whose, whose orientation, as far as I can judge, is damage control and damage limitation rather than enhancing recognition protection. So I don't see the executive committee either as a mechanism which would be honest to do this um, oversight and monitoring responsibility. Thank you. I think we have one, one more question from Madeleine. Birgit's question we will discuss in the third section. Yeah. Um, so what do you think of uh, states uh, restricting access to their territory? Oh, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, this we we will we will come to this. I think in the third third sex. Okay, so then that would be maybe uh, still the question on the durable solutions. Like, is still UN, UNHCR still fit for durable solutions as many refugees live in protected protracted refugee situations? Well, I mean, um, you know, one of the things that when I was with UNHCR, one of the things that did not exist was a durable solutions, um, a dedicated durable solutions uh, focus in the organization. Um, the organization used to be accused by some uh, writers outside the organization of having an exilic bias, that is having a bias towards refugees in asylum and assisting them and protecting them in asylum situations. 
rather than trying to resolve their problems and realize solutions for them. There was a sense that the organization hadn't placed enough emphasis on solutions. It was something that, at least when I was there, I did place a lot of emphasis on. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't got time, unfortunately, but I could relate some quite interesting uh, anecdotes about how the search for solutions actually took precedence over improving um, the asylum environment in which refugees were in exile outside um, a country that had been durable residence. So yes, it wasn't it wasn't a, a um, it, it, solutions were always promoted by UNHCR, but there wasn't a dedicated financial um, line to support that and there wasn't a dedicated inside the organization to pursue solutions um, in the way that I understand exists now. So I don't think the question has as much relevance as it did. I think solutions are not something that UNHCR itself, however, just produce out of the blue. Solutions are something that has to be agreed and negotiated with states, and that is becoming increasingly difficult. I mean, the three classical solutions are return and voluntary return when it's possible and safe to do so. And um, that is decreasingly a prospect for many refugees because of the violence and the violence is cyclical and the conflict continues, etc. Second solution, local integration. Um, given where most refugees find themselves and the circumstances of the countries in which they seek first asylum, local integration is a has always been remains a very difficult solution to realise. There have been some sterling examples of local integration being granted on a durable basis, such as Tanzania with Burundians, etc. But um, one thing I would say is that just as we see a lot of asylum fatigue in developed countries, we see asylum becoming much more transactional in first asylum countries. Um, you know, it is you give us and we can do, but if you don't, we can't type situation, which I understand as well. It goes to the whole question of assistance and how fundamental is assistance, protection, buying assistance, etc. I mean, assistance, buying protection. But um, all of that said, and then the third solution is resettlement. Resettlement has always been a difficult solution for a small minority of people. I mean, I think less than the statistic used to be, less than 7% of those identified as in urgent need of settlement are able to achieve the resettlement solution. Um, and that's a very small percentage. I mean, you know, talking about 100,000 people out of a much larger number who should have been able to access resettlement. And, you know, two-thirds of resettlement submissions go to about five or six countries. So there's not really a strong burden sharing when it comes to resettlement, and it is a solution, but it's a protection mechanism as well. And it's so all this to say it's not in UNHCR's hands uh, the realization of solutions, more activity to pursue them, more investment in it, a more aggressive pursuit of solutions is in UNHCR's hands. But the realization of solutions depends on states' cooperation, and that is increasingly more complex. Thank you, Erica. And I think we should move on because we have some very interesting questions in the third block. Uh, before delving into my own questions, I would like to show the last part of our video and our the input from colleagues on the last question is on the international protection regime. Well, the international protection system has taken a battering, but it's still unbeaten and it has provided protection to millions of refugees who have fled persecution, war and civil unrest. The international protection system fit for purpose. It seems to me that more and more frequently we have to field questions about whether the international protection regime is fit for purpose. 
This is particularly true when we consider the impact of climate change, natural disasters, or growing societal inequities, which force people to move. Situations that lead to displacement are becoming ever more complex. But while it may indeed be the case that it is more difficult to distinguish between the various drivers of forced displacement, I believe we should recognize that the international protection system is part and parcel of a broader international law framework that is continuously evolving, both globally and at the regional level. A balance needs to be found between protection principles and pragmatism. Political will from states is still required in order to concretize and operationalize the principles of international cooperation, solidarity, and responsibility sharing. In my view, it needs it needs some some reflection, uh, but it can't just be uh, Eurocentric or driven by industrialized country. We need to understand the dynamics of the movement better because the, new, the movements are not just south-north, they are mainly south-south uh, for, for refugees and on on, on asylum seekers. Uh, but in my current position as a special envoy for the central and western Mediterranean situation, I see life being broken down on lot every day, on routes, at sea in traffickers' warehouses, in immigration detention centers. Now, you know, we can't live with that. We can't live with that. Uh, those dangerous movements must be avoided, and they must be avoided with uh, credible alternative for the people. I think that's a very strong statement by Vincent, and a strong appeal to look at realities on the ground but then also an appeal from Juan Carlos, and you have made the same that we have to work with states. So my question to you is, international protection, is this a UNHCR responsibility or a state responsibility? Well, I mean, there's an easy answer to that. Essentially, it's a state responsibility. States have the primary responsibility under international law, um, under conventions, but also uh, customary international law, and it's their responsibility to live up to that and to provide protection. UNHCR has no territory. Uh, it doesn't have the capacity to take people under its umbrella and out of harm's way. It has to rely on working with states to do that. Um, it is, while UNHCR always argues that the protection mandate is an obligatory mandate, it's not a discretionary one, and it allows UNHCR to intervene regardless of whether states invite intervention. I think all of that's true, but the reality on the ground, as our colleagues have said, is that this is a state, you know, a world of states, nation states, uh, who have their own sovereignty um, concerns and their own sovereignty requirements, and the UNHCR has to manage its mandate in that real world. So uh, it's states, um, but UNHCR has an obligation to try and broaden uh, asylum space so that asylum is available to uh, work for solutions, as we said, so that solutions are realizable. Um, but you can't do it alone. No, I mean, I've asked this question, I put this question on my list, and maybe the audience doesn't know that, uh, but we've all very often in UNHCR, we face situations where states turn to us and um, basically try to put um, the situation as if it was you at UNHCR to resolve and try to put the responsibility on us, which is very dangerous. And sometimes it's also hard for us to really clarify the situation that it is a state responsibility. We can assist, but we cannot take over that responsibility. But now, if we look in today's world, I mean, we here in Europe, but I'm sure you see something similar in Australia. We think that basic protection principles and states' preparedness to uphold them is, is starting or has, is eroding. Um, we, I mean, we have been talking about Fortress Europe for a very long time here in, here in Europe, but what we see now is absolutely not it hasn't been imaginable at the time when you were still in Geneva. Uh, 
Um, so we are very much concerned here what this will all lead to and uh, I'm sure that you know colleagues at the audience would like to hear a little bit what you think about the Australian example, the Australian solution and how do you see this? Is there any support still there for states for protection? Well, yes, I mean, Australia is not a good example <laughs> to bring up at the present time. I, I, Australia um, has a very good record when it comes to resettlement uh, and particularly uh, integration of people who have been settled in this country. Um, it has traditionally, until a number of years ago, been a progressive actor on the protection stage. It has supported protection initiatives. I mean, it was an Australian initiative that led to the famous Conclusion 22. I mean, the audience are all too young probably to remember Conclusion 22, but it was the conclusion which enabled uh, temporary asylum to be given to uh, the large numbers of Vietnamese who were fleeing out of uh, Vietnam and were being met in the first instance by closed borders and having to deal with pirates at sea, etc. And that was, in fact, the first articulation of uh, the importance of treating asylum seekers different, differently, offering temporary asylum, making space for solutions. And that was actually an Australian initiative. So, you know, it has a long and distinguished record. It was Australia's accession to the 1951 convention, which actually was the one that brought that convention into force. So now that is a long, way, long time ago uh, from now. And what we're seeing now is an abhorrence when it comes to dealing with people who arrive in Australia or see arrive in Australia by sea. They are not only turned back, but they are actually transported to two remote centres that have been transported. The arrivals are virtually stopped as a result of all of this. To two remote centres, one on the Pacific island of Nauru and the other one, a little island attached to one of the islands of Papua New Guinea. And there they've been held for, in effect, in indefinite detention for lengthy periods of time, very delayed processing of their claims, denied any access to the Australian mainland um, in the event that they were found to be refugees, and only relatively recently allowed access for extreme medical conditions. And, of course, many of them were in very difficult medical circumstances, particularly uh, their mental health suffered desperately as a result of being trapped year after year after year with no no vision of where they would, when they would be able to leave these centres. So it's it's a very bad period in Australia's, Australia's asylum history. Um, it is coming to an end in the sense that there have been a lot of deals and a lot of arrangements which have eventually allowed the movement of people out of these centres to other countries than Australia for settlement, the United States in particular, but not only. I think some have gone to Switzerland and some have gone elsewhere as well. Um, so but that's, you know, I when I talk about bottom lines, and flexibility, but bottom lines. I say that this is an example of where bottom lines are starting to fall to a new low, and it is a very worrying development. <clears throat> One of the other problems, of course, in the Australian situation is that Australia is a country that doesn't recognise the impact of international law unless it is legislated through domestic legislation. So the 1951 Convention has not been brought into effect, if you like, through pieces of domestic legislation. It has been mentioned in relevant acts, such as the Migration Act, but as part of this policy of what the government termed um, a, a humane deterrence, addressing the problem of people smuggling and the dangers that posed for deaths at sea, etc., putting people on islands rather than allowing them to come here and encouraging the smuggling industry. As part of this, they have amended a lot of the pieces of legislation in this country to delete references to the 1951 Convention and indeed to do the most extraordinary thing. I found it legislatively extraordinary that they can excise from Australian territory pieces of Australian territory 
um, where they say excise from the ambit of the Migration Act. So people can land in places like Christmas Island or um, other of these sort of strange reefs off Australia, National Cartier Reef, etc., which have been physically, le legally excised from the territory of Australia for the purposes of the application of the Migration Act. Um, you know, these are quite extreme responses to what has been a relatively very small problem when it comes to numbers, albeit a very big problem for the government politically, and that has driven the government and indeed the opposition party as well to rather uh, hostile asylum uh, approaches. So, you know, I, I have spoken about this a lot and I have uh, expressed my view unequivocally, which is that unacceptable and it is not compatible with Australia's obligations under the 1951 Convention or any party's obligations under the Convention. But, you know, governments are governments. Yeah, no, that's a very triste reality. I mean, we see here in Europe that there are many politicians who look are very keen to, to, towards what uh, Australia has achieved, so to speak. But fortunately, here in Europe, obviously, we have the European Court on Human Rights, which has clearly clarified that you can exile territory from your legislation, but you cannot exile territory from your international obligations under human rights instruments. And we are very grateful for, for that cl clarity of the U European Court on Human Rights. But we still see pushbacks, uh, frontiers being, uh, being made up, people are brought back to Libya, boats that are left alone uh, in the distress as, at sea here in Europe. I mean, it's it, the, the situation here has become also a lot more challenging. You and I, we don't like to stop, you know, where we see very problematic practices evolving. And you said governments are governments. I think, you know, it's important, we you know, you have already elaborated a little bit the reasons behind these harsh reactions of, from governments. But I think we have to look a little bit into what are solutions. I mean, how is there any possibility to turn basically the to turn this this ever more restrictive the ever more restrictive policies of governments? What would be a better way forward? Well, <clears throat> you know, some people have said there should be new international rules, new instruments. I I, I sympathise with that, but doubt the feasibility or practicality of that. They've said that the uh, 1951 convention should be redrafted and amended to uh, address more directly current realities and make it very clear what responsibilities lie on um, people when it comes to uh, large-scale arrivals or people arriving through um, means that are irregular, irregular means, um, etc. I I'm not sure that you can manage it through legislation uh, or, or, or manage it through um, new international instruments. That's my first point. Um, without belaboring the point, I think the 10-point plan needs to be looked at seriously because it offers some alternatives um, when it comes to strategizing around difficult caseloads. And I think strategizing around difficult caseloads is important. But of course, you know, we have now on the table and in operation the Global Compact on Refugees. One of the issues, I think, which has driven more restrictive asylum policies, which has helped to support the uh, response of the international community to large-scale movements of people has been what has traditionally always been recognised as inequitable responsibility sharing, inequitable burden sharing, and the sense that the burdens of managing large-scale arrivals have fallen predominantly on country, the most ill-prepared and ill-equipped to deal with them, and um, that has sort of has an impact in these countries and had its impact also the way, um, the way people move on and are driven to leave first asylum countries and move on as part of this irregular uh, sea arrival flow that Son talked about. Um, 
So the Global Compact on Refugees, 2018 Compact, I think I, I didn't have anything to do with it. I had a lot to do with the predecessor process, which generated the agenda for protection, but not this one. I think the Global Compact process was very well conceived. Its, its intended purpose was to sort of give content and definition to uh, responsibility sharing. What did it mean to give um, states a menu of options um, which they could choose from to address some of the inequities in the burden sharing system and to improve, improve the circumstances for refugees in first asylum and uh, uh, further afield. It was a, um, I think, also successfully a mechanism to bring more funds uh, to the refugee uh, assistance, refugee protection environment um, by finally addressing this sort of debate that's been raging for years and years and years about uh, development aid versus humanitarian assistance and how do you bridge the gap transition from humanitarian assistance to development aid? How do you bring more development aid into the services of better assisting and protecting refugees and at the same time contributing to the broader development environment of the countries that are hosting them, uh, etc. So all of that I think is good and it has produced, generated some very good results. The fact is it's not a legal instrument. Uh, the fact is that it's very much a, a voluntary um, that depends a lot on voluntary buy-in, and you will probably have more to say about it, Anya, because you're working directly with it, and I'm not. I'm more reading about it these days than working with it. Um, but when I looked at the text, apart from being daunted by the number of words and the number of pages and the number of qualifiers in the text, you know, if possible, when appropriate, um, in accordance, in full respect of national exigencies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, being daunted by all of that, I was driven to ask myself the question whether this was really going to be a magic bullet when it came to um, helping to address the gaps in the protection uh, and assistance regime for refugees, or was it really going to be an enabler for states to do a little bit more of what they've always done, perhaps a little bit better, and then rest on their laurels and not go much further when it came to all the more imaginative uh, initiatives envisaged in this menu of options set out in this global compact. I, when I read, you know, the kind of pledges it's generated, um, bringing refugees into uh, health systems, um, creating more education opportunities for refugees, generating World Bank, World Bank funding for refugees. I think all of that is actually not to be underestimated. Um, and they, they, these are achievements. However, they're relatively small in the scheme of things. And on top of that, I think, um, you know, you have a, a, a compact which depends for its administration on an enormous, you talked about bureaucracy earlier, I, astonished by the bureaucracy which accompanies the compact process. So there's endless numbers of meetings and meetings of high senior officials and meetings of global fora and whatever. They're probably all to the better in the long run if they generate um, new pledges and these pledges are acted upon, etc. So it's all worth the effort. But I only say I'm very pleased that I'm not involved in the administration of this because I I see that it is hugely administrative. Um, and then, you know, there are a lot of other issues that come up. I'm currently on a UN senior advisors panel, which is a very interesting panel, nothing to do with refugees at all. But it raises, it, it, it's addressing, amongst other issues, issues linked to accountability or performance of international obligations. And one of the concerns coming up in all of our discussions in this panel is um, the, is it desirable or not desirable to uh, produce a discretionary type arrangement and superimpose discretionary responsibilities onto normative and legal responsibilities and thereby give states the option 
to say, well, you know, um, the uh, global compact, for example, it is a discretionary, uh, discretionary set of, of um, paragraphs. It gives states the option to say, well, this is what is now guiding our response to refugee problems, rather than the normative and rights framework, uh, which refugee should be located. In a sense, it enables the substitution of discretionary choices for obligatory responsibility. And I think there is, it, it may not work out that way at all, but I think there is a potential danger there that the office will have to be aware of as it goes down this line of the Global Compact. Final thing I want to say about the Global Compact, <clears throat> Because interestingly, I had to peer review several articles recently, and I, I learned quite a lot about the Global Compact from peer reviewing these articles. And, and one of the concerns of one of the writers was about whether or not this focus on development distance was just not a another way of um, uh, keeping refugees in uh, less than satisfactory circumstances in countries as far away as possible. Um, where the solutions might otherwise be realised. In other words, is it really helping to rectify the burden sharing and responsibility sharing, or is it solidifying um, a burden sharing and a responsibility share, or a burden shifting and a responsibility shifting? Um, uh, not least because there was a lot of querying amongst some of these writers about whether, in fact, you can um, really without a very much more concerted development aid focus, change the balance of, um, change the circumstances so materially for refugees in, in, uh, in developing countries that it makes their stay genuinely sustainable and possible, genuinely uh, contributes to a marked improvement in the development environment in these countries. There were queries about whether this, this is the underlying assumption that's going to happen and whether or not it's all burden, burden and responsibility shifting. I pass no judgment on that. I don't really know <coughs> the answer to it, but these are questions academics raise. Maybe they're not questions that come up in the real world of refugee protection and refugee assistance, but they are worth bearing in mind when one goes further into implementation of this. Well, thank you for your assessment of the global compact. Some very critical remarks, but also for your, you know, for highlighting that one of the solutions, the way forward for sure, is to, in, to strengthen international cooperation and solidarity sharing with states, whether the global compact is the right tool we will see. But I remember one of the first meetings I had to go to when I came to Geneva, was um, a meeting on burden sharing. And I remember I came out and you asked me how it was. And I, I was just telling you, I mean, this was this going nowhere. It's going nowhere. It was just the first international discussion I saw. And it was very clear that after, you know, days and days of discussion on burden sharing, states couldn't agree on anything. I think from that point, we have made some progress for sure. Whether it's sufficient, we will see. I mean, the challenges that you outlined remain for sure and they have to be looked at. We also think here in Europe that international cooperation and solidarity sharing among European states could be a solution to the, the issues, the challenges, protection challenges we see right now. Um, and we think obviously that among more like-minded states in Europe, it should be more easy, but the reality is a little bit different. I mean, there's now a new instrument from the European Commission that the European Commission has put forward, but whether it will see the light of the day and whether it will indeed, you know, lead to a better cooperation or to um, further responsibility shifting, we will have to see. I saw that there were some interesting questions in the quote, Sarah. Maybe you can bring them into the discussion. Yes, sure. Um, one question was about um, whether the um, system chosen by the European Union, the Common European Asylum System, uh, whether it uh, interprets the Geneva Convention correctly or differently than in other parts of the world. How do you see the latest developments? 
I'm not sure I'm the one to answer that question because I have been out of discussions on the common European asylum system for a while. So, you know, my knowledge dates back. When I was let working me take on it, that question. Was... Erica, let me take that question because Please, I... Please, you do. You know, I have written an article like 15 years ago, whether, you know, about a new refugee system, you, you know, being evolving in Europe. And I have been, I have to update an article which I wrote a long time ago on Europe. And I'm realized that unfortunately my fears from 15 years ago are materializing. So what we see is, I mean, that um, the European, the common European asylum system, I mean, obviously, it's it, it's still a strong system if we compare with other uh, regions of the world, but we see it's deviating from the 51 convention, and there are it is there are there is indeed a danger that um, and we see it's materializing that danger that it is a, a protection system which is still related um, but has which has evolved from the 51 convention. There are several provisions in the qualification directive which are um, already from their wording deviating from the 51 convention and some of the interpretive guidance in the qualification directive is also not in line with what we think in UNHCR is international uh, in line with the 51 convention. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that the European Court on Human Rights has um, corrected some of those uh, problematic provisions. So, I mean, the question is, Unfortunately, we have to see that we have very problematic situation here in Europe and coming back to global governance. I mean, obviously, it threatens the, 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 the global standards if we have a system in one region, which is still very solid and strong, but deviating from the international system. I mean, I would I'm, I'm not commenting on that any way at all, Anya, but only to say that I don't think something which is different from the uh, international system is necessarily bad if it takes it forward and it adjusts it to regional specificities. It's only when it goes backwards from the system rather than forwards that I think there's a problem to be addressed. But sort of having a slavish, you know, restatement of an existing instrument um, is not necessarily the best thing either. But then again, could be uh, an irrelevant comment. Uh, no, anyone. I think it's a very good comment because we see in both directions. We are very happy of the features where the European system goes a bit further, you know, than the international system. But obviously, it's more challenging where it, where it leaves behind, legs behind. Sarah, is there are more questions? Because yes, we only uh, have two or three more minutes. But yeah, I will. I will try to summarize two questions. So one is about um, the role of UNHCR with regard to environmental refugees or climate refugees. Should uh, UNHCR more advocate for those new types of displaced people? And another one goes a little bit in the same direction. Uh, should UNHCR promote migration programs and alternative stay arrangements or rather not? Um, because uh, they could maybe also undermine the refugee resettlement in the system. Well, I think, you know, just as the refugee protection instruments are more and more embedded in the bigger, broader human rights instruments, UNHCR is more and more embedded in the uh, more global arrangements for addressing people on the move for all sorts of reasons. So um, there are global arrangements which involve now increasing the International Organization for Migration, which involve um, the big assistance agencies in the UN, which involve a plethora of NGOs, etc. And I think UNHCR can rightly play its part. UNHCR has been involved, at least in my day, um, for very good reasons in protection and assistance activities on behalf of people who have been displaced as a result of natural disasters, not as a matter of mandate course, but as a matter of practicality, UNHCR has been involved, either because it's there on the ground when other agencies aren't, or it has its warehouses available to take uh, uh, provisions from to assist people, or because it is a trusted 
partner of a government in a country where a natural disaster has taken place and therefore the government prefers to work with a trusted partner like UNHCR than others it doesn't know. So there is a role for UNHCR to play in the broader um, environment of assisting and protecting people driven from their homes for a range of reasons. It doesn't mean that the mandate um, redefined. It doesn't mean that you know UNHCR should be given a new mandate to do all of this, but it does mean that UNHCR is increasingly an actor in a broader environment with all sorts of actors with a role to play. You only have to look at the whole cluster system which has been set up um, for the United Nations to respond to complex emergencies. UNHCR is but one amongst many actors it has a supervisory responsibility for the protection cluster, but there are other clusters as well. And UNHCR is part of a bigger product cluster system. So I think the short answer is yes, UNHCR has a role to play, not derived from its mandate specifically, derived from its expertise and experience dealing with displacement, and derived from its responsible engagement um, with a broader international response. Uh, and then going back to the Global Compact, I think the Global Compact envisages a number of things, such as alternative um, migration routes, so as not to um, distort the alternative uh, temporary migration solutions, etc. And I think UNHCR has a role to play there. As I said, I don't want to leave on the Global Compact on a negative. I agree with Anya that it was a, a very important achievement, not one to be underestimated um, in a, a world where there's a lot of negativity towards asylum and refugees and a world grappling ever increasingly with problems. And the unstated word in the room has been COVID-19 and what impact that's had. Um, and I think it's amazing the Global Compact is still galvanizing um, states to make pledges and to honor pledges, among them, uh, by the way. I think it's very impressive, this creation of, a, of an education uh, education for, for people in emergency situations. I mean, I don't know what the official title of it is, but I think it's a very good initiative. And I think in this era of COVID-19, where states have sort of driven to look more and more internally and guard their resources for internal demands and protecting their own populations and things. It's terrific that the Global Compact can still be an instrument which brings states to make pledges, uh, pledges beyond their own boundaries. So in that sense, it's, 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 it has tremendous potential. Thank you, Erica. Is there maybe one last question? Because I think we should then uh, come to an end because people are leaving. I think we've dealt with the question so okay far. perfect then i think eric i would like to thank you for being uh, um, for being open to so many questions from myself and also from the audience and for being with us today we will just go to the breakout room again but i just want also to thank the audience um for being with us for discussing with us and of course i want to thank sarah and the university of fribourg for hosting this this lecture together with us. Sarah, the well, final let me, let me add my voice, Anya, to yours and say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to think about all of these issues again. Um, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to come back to them. I've probably said things which a lot of UNHCR staff may disagree with, but that's the joy of working for UNHCR. There were always very, you know, variety of opinions and they all have to be accommodated at some point towards a common goal of better protection. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk a bit more and think a bit more about it. And thank you, Sarah, also for providing a, a super forum. Thank you to both of you, Anya and Erica. It was lovely. And, and I think um, there's a lot, we've talked about the challenges, but there's also a lot to be proud of. So UNHCR, I think 70 years, that's still a success story. And I think UNHCR is still fit for purpose, especially with people like you who are so flexible and, and always reacting uh, to the new challenges. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope you stay safe, <laughs> all of you, and, and, and I see you again soon.